So, they asked me to talk about what happened in the meantime about recent trials and, and studies and, and so on. So I guess there are two remotes. If one is not working, maybe the other one will. Yeah. Yeah, this is for okay, voting. Okay, this one is working. Uh, first of all, this is my disclosure uh, of conflict of interest. And uh, so, let's start with this talk. Um, I'm happy that you call me expert, but actually I find that sometimes we, we refer to ourselves as experts. And uh, very often we like to make very clever judgments about fluids and so on and so on. And, and I have to say, I do like to use echocardiography at the bedside. I do like to use more advanced monitoring. Uh, for a lot of the patients that I take into the intensive care. The truth is that not always we use all this advanced monitoring. So while I would agree with you that we need to be a bit more careful about how we give fluids, for instance, I'm not so much against when we have a patient admitted in the emergency department with another 30 or 40 patients, maybe to start to give a bit of fluids and to start some antibiotics early. Because it's very easy to be in this room with what we like to be so-called experts, and to talk about a patient where we really have the time to focus on this, but a lot of the diseases that we treat are actually are, are time dependent. So I think doing something probably is important. I guess the real question is how much could you do without advanced monitoring? Now with Fenice, we actually asked the next step, which was um, if uh, you have a patient in your intensive care unit, what do you use to trigger your uh, fluid resuscitation to give a fluid challenge? What guides your fluid challenge? And also, how do we give fluid challenge? And I will show you some slides during uh, this talk and also come into two other studies that we've done. As you see, still in 2015, and I can tell you the studies of Xavier Monet and Jean-Louis Teboul and, and many others have been out already for 10, 15 years uh, at this time. So we know that the CVP is not a good preload index. Still, at the bedside, that's what most clinicians do. So I don't know if the stewardship is the right approach, but certainly, Probably going back to a bit of physiology is what we need to understand how we use CVP. Uh, many people think that when I show this slide, I'm against CVP and I don't measure CVP. Actually, it's the opposite. Uh, I will talk a bit about physiology uh, later on, but actually I do like to measure the CVP and I, I like to see the interactions between fluid administrations and cardiac output and backwards pressures and so on. What is scary probably is also that when we looked at the response, still we are triggered by hypotension, but also we looked at blood pressure as our main variable to decide if the patient had responded to fluids or not. And what was surprising in this is that uh, we still like to look at numbers, but when it comes to look, for instance, at perfusion measures like lactate or skin perfusion or mental state, which I would argue it's always the first part in my decision to give fluids. Actually, they're very uh, low down the line to see if the, uh, the patient has really improved or not. What is the problem with blood pressure? Well, there is no problem if you give fluids. If we give a bolus of fluids and the blood pressure goes up, it doesn't require an advanced echocardiographer or somebody with a cardiac output monitor to realize that the cardiac output has increased and the blood pressure has increased. Of course, that is a positive response. The problem is that very often our patients are very sick. They have norepinephrine ongoing and so on. So if I just looked at changes in blood pressure, I could be completely blinded to what happens in terms of cardiac output. Indeed, in these uh, uh, patients with septic shock, what we found was that both uh, arteroventricular coupling variables and uh, systemic vascular resistance, actually, they do change even in those patients that increase cardiac output, but they have no changes whatsoever in blood pressure. It's a bit like fluids are vasodilating these patients in this moment, which is not necessarily a bad thing if I'm in the early phase of septic shock, I'm recruiting some microcirculation, and I want to improve flow. However, if my clinical question is also about improving perfusion pressure, giving just fluids in a patient that is very vasoplegic may not be the right answer. What do we do at the bedside when we decide to give fluids? Well, the variability is really huge. Uh, in Fenice, we found that it goes uh, from a median of 500, but we were able to see fluid challenges of 200 ml given in 15 minutes or half an hour to 2 liters of fluids given in one hour. I suspect there's nothing clever in the 60 minutes that you see there. Um, I looked in it, and I think 99% of the infusion pumps that we use in the intensive care has a maximum speed of uh, one liter per hour. So that's often why that's the rate that, that we give. Now, when we started to look at all of this, I became fascinated by the fact that, uh, yes, we do a lot of trials, 
But are we really sure that we know the physiology of fluid administration and actually that we know really what happens when we decide to give a fluid bolus? Let's ignore for the moment the clinical question, which of course is the most important one. But I've decided in my head that there is hypoperfusion. I think that the patient is fluid responsive and I now want to give fluids. Well, let's see what happens. So what we did was actually a study to look at the uh, kinetics and dynamics of fluid administration in terms of cardiac output changes in patients in intensive care. So we took an area under the curve approach. Uh, we gave fluids in about uh, five, 10 minutes, uh, four milliliters per kilogram. And we looked at the maximum change. Uh, we looked at the, after the maximum change, what is the time for this maximum change? And we also follow after the initial response for 10 minutes what happened. Now, of course, uh, as you see here, cardiac output was different from responders and non-responders. We selected the two groups, so there's nothing uh, interesting in there. Uh, but see this. So the maximum response is within one minute after the end of fluid administration. This is very important because I will show you this now. Um, if I go away and I come back, I can completely miss this. So the distribution of fluids and the effect of fluids is very fast. And what was more striking, actually, was the sustainability of the effect of fluids, both in responders and in non-responders. So even in the responders, we had an initial response to fluids, but after 10 minutes, they almost went back to baseline. So this is now posing more questions, which we are trying to answer with uh, other studies that we are doing. Uh, I have to say this study was done in a situation of clinical stability at the bedside, and maybe that's the problem. Uh, why? Because if I'm already being stabilized, if I give a bolus of fluid to my patient, maybe I'm just testing them for externally in response. But if I do not need fluids to increase my venous return and my oxygen delivery, maybe the human body just gets rid of it into the unstressed volume because I do not need this increase in oxygen delivery. That's one explanation. The other explanation is that simply the effects that we see and how much we've been fixating on the Frank Starling response is just as a temporary mechanism. So it's something that works for a bit. We are just testing how good the preload reserve of the heart is, but we're not really testing how sustained the effect for the circulation is, which is what really interested me in a responding patient. Uh, speaking with some friends, uh, somebody was also speculating, maybe in 10 minutes you already start to see some capillary leak. I don't believe so in this group of patients. This was uh, done in stability mainly in post-surgical patients. Some that were sicker than others, but I do not believe that you can lose uh, 400 mLs in 5-10 minutes of fast. I, I believe more that this was an effect on the stress volume, depending on the two uh, hypotheses that I just told you. But this is just to show you that we focus so much on these black and white response, yes and no, responders and non-responders. I think the pharmacodynamics and the pharmacokinetics of fluid administrations are a bit more complex than that. So one other question that we wanted to answer was, um, OK, I've decided that I want to give fluids to this patient. And I agree with Xavier. If we can identify the non-responders, that's great. Let's not give fluids. But if I decided that I want to give fluids, I want to know how much fluid do I have to give to stress the system enough. So we randomize patients to 1 milliliter, 2 milliliters, 3, and 4 milliliters per kilogram. And we found that with 4 milliliters per kilogram, given in about 5, 10 minutes, we were able in 95% of the patients to increase significantly the mean systemic filling pressure. And I will show you why in a second this is very important. Because if I looked at the baseline of this patient, they were all equal. But just by increasing the dose of fluid, I had a very important difference in the response of what I consider a fluid responder or not. And going back to what I was showing you before in terms of the positivity of the response or not, I do think it's very important. I also think it's very important because when I do something at the bedside, I have an unconscious bias. Usually if I give fluids, I've already decided that I hope that the patient will give fluids. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing that. And if I don't trust either a positive or a negative response, I may give very bad uh, decisions maybe later on. I'll show you, for instance, what we found in Fenice. We asked uh, the clinicians, uh, what do you actually do after the first fluid challenge? Did you give another one? And about 50% of the patient received an extra fluid challenge. This was in about 48% of the ones with an initial positive response. And when we looked at this data, we thought, actually, this is good. So there was a positive response, but not everyone with a positive response got extra fluid just because the patient was a responder. Uh, maybe the clinicians thought the 
the clinical situation had improved, so I do not give any more fluids. However, when we looked at the uncertain response, which means the clinician is not sure if the patient has really responded or not, then further fluids were given. And what is more striking, where the clinician was sure that there was a negative response, still we're giving some escar fluids just to try again. And I do believe that giving too much fluid is, of course, dangerous. Uh, I guess the question is how much can we control at the very beginning and how much is a sensible maybe limit to put in our heads when we have to go with further monitoring without delaying fluid administration. This is an observational study from, done in America with a very large database. Um, so it's propensity score match, not randomized. It just shows you that between predicted and observed mortality, when you start to give probably more than five liters during the first day, you start to see that there is clearly an effect in which fluid seems to be harmful. But these are recipes and are not really individualizing fluid therapies. Uh, as you know, this was a study done recently in resource limited settings. Again, a lot of more fluids. The trigger was hypertension, but I couldn't find any physiological rationale to carry on or to stop there. And I think this is also another important message. Just because we don't have anything better, it doesn't mean that we need to give everything uh, to everyone. For instance, uh, some other groups are now moving to actually think, can we use a restrictive approach? Uh, Anders Perner have done this study in which he was giving fluid boluses only if the patient had significant lactatemia, only if the blood pressure were dropping below 50, while in the other group, fluids were just given in a liberal way. I would argue that the restrictive group was a goal-directed group. We can agree on how restrictive or liberal the goals were, but I would argue there was a goal there, where in the liberal there was no goal, and they found no differences in outcome. But interestingly, in the exploratory analysis, they did find that there was possibly some benefit for the restrictive group in terms of progression to acute kidney injury. Uh, I don't have time for this, but there is some very nice physiological rationale about uh, venous congestion or maybe chloride overload for which maybe excess fluids can, can act on this. Um, I don't have time to go into all the debate of colloids and crystalloids. Uh, in Fenice, we were finding that uh, in, when it comes to crystalloids, about 50-50% is split. If you ask me what I use in my unit, I would tell you 95% 90, of the time, unless I have some neuro patients in which I want to increase the osmolality a bit, I probably use balanced crystalloid. What is the evidence around it? Probably the largest study so far that tested balanced crystalloids against uh, saline is this one. Uh, they were able to randomize patients to receive either one or the other, and they were able to show that there was, for instance, an increase in chloride if you give uh, um, chloride rich solutions. Now, this is true and this is significant as they show you, but however, I would like to point out to you what is the scale. Okay, so we are expanded the scale to show that there is an effect. I don't believe you can actually see this in your uh, practice, a change in one or two millimoles of chloride. Nevertheless, it is true that they did find an improvement in outcome, but this improvement in outcome, which was significant, and in this was the primary outcome, so this is a positive study, was about 15% versus 14 point something percent. If you ask me, if normal saline is the only fluid that you have in the emergency department now, and they have to go and get some balanced solution somewhere else in two or three hours, I will still give saline for this. If you ask me what can I prefer, of course, is a balanced solution. Um, a lot of the evidence which I show you today, it's in some of the consensus papers that we've published. This is a few years old now, it was on hemodynamic monitoring. Uh, we also very recently just came out today, published one looking at what happened. I will be very on time. I, I, will, <laughs> I will show you that actually if you read this paper which is available today, we couldn't find any evidence to recommend pretty much anything from what comes in administration of fluids outside of the intensive care settings, apart from maybe the operating rooms. So I do believe that actually we need to go back to physiology, even in these settings, there's the majority of patients that we treat. So my take on message, I have 38 seconds to go through them. But I think I agree with Manu, fluids are drugs. Uh, let's give less if in doubt. Uh, if you must give it, try to standardize it in the practice. I don't have the perfect recipe, but do something that you believe, whether it is positive or negative. And remember, there are some differences between the initial response and the sustainability of the response. So let's consider them a drug, and let's consider all the variables on them. Thank you.